what was the reason to, to start working on this topic for us? Well, first of all, there is a very rapid development of platforms, both sharing platforms and gig platforms. So, for example, uh, Airbnb offered 31,000 houses in the Netherlands in 2016. There were 200,000 participants in Snapcar and 900,000 uh, cleaning jobs uh, through Helpling. Um, so there's this very rapid development. On the other hand, after the initial excitement about all these developments, we also saw growing unrest. So for example, nuisance for the neighborhood, mostly related to Airbnb, but also unfair competition. So what does it mean for somebody having a restaurant if your neighbor can also just open a kind of restaurant in their, in their living room and they don't have to apply or to abide, all the, abide by all the rules that exist. That's unfair. Um, and tax avoidance, because especially in the, well, actually both the sharing and gig platforms, people might make quite a lot of money, especially in the accommodation part, uh, but they tend not to pay taxes about this. So if this thing gets really big, then we actually, or the government misses out on a lot of income. So, our main question was how, how can public interests that are affected by the sharing and gig economy be safeguarded? Um, and we had three sub-questions. What do we mean exactly by the sharing and gig economy? And because it's such a new phenomenon, a lot of things get put under these headings, but what exactly uh, is the definition of these uh, phenomena? What public interests are affected by the sharing and gig economy? And um, that's, I think, the main part of, of the research. And how can these uh, public interests be safeguarded? And then we looked at, you know, what ideas exist, what has already been tried, and what, what are uh, things that could still be done. And we looked both at the national and local government level. So it's a very uh, rich picture. And let's get started with, with the definition. Um, oh, if any of you have, has some question for clarification, just uh, raise your hand, that's, that's fine. So we make a distinction between sharing and gig economy. Maybe for you, uh, these things are not new, but um, we thought it was worthwhile to point this out. So the sharing economy is about goods, sharing things. And the official definition is consumers granting each other access to underutilized physical assets, possibly for money. And it, it's important that these things were idle, standing idle. So if you buy a car to then put it on Snapcar, that, that's not idle capacity. But if it's your own car that's just sitting there in the parking lot for four days a week, then it's idle. The other thing is the gig economy, which is about services. So consumers providing services for, what, for one another, possibly for money. And um, then we have some other things that might get confused with the sharing or gig economy, which is the second-hand economy, which is about, it's, it is, has to do with consumer to consumer and with goods, but the ownership is transferred forever, basically. So it's, uh, it's not sharing. And then there's the product service economy, which is basically if you rent a car at the airport from Avis or uh, Europe car, um, that's business to consumer. So that's not sharing economy. So we look at sharing economy and gig economy only. And as I said, we tend to do empirical research to see what is really happening and what are the issues uh, at stake. So we picked five case studies, and they are on the spectrum of services and goods that I just uh, told you about. So there is the cleaning platform Helpling, which I already mentioned, which is for sure a, a gig economy platform. The same goes for Uberpop, um, which doesn't exist anymore in the Netherlands, but it's a historical case study. Um, then on the other end of the spectrum, there is Snapcar and Airbnb, which have to do with sharing goods, so your house and your car. And Airbnb is a little bit in the middle. Um, so 
as a home restaurant, you both uh, open your house for people, which you can see as a, as a good or an asset, but at the same time you're cooking for them, which is a service, so they're a little bit in the middle. And we looked at positive and negative effects on public interest. These positive and negative effects can cover both economic issues, uh, social issues and environmental issues, and you will, you will see them uh, in these lists. So first of all, these platforms can bring additional wealth, either because goods are, more exp are cheaper to come by, or because you can make some money through a platform uh, where you previously had no way to do that. Um, another thing is entrepreneurship. These platforms offer people the opportunity to start something new, see how it works. Imagine somebody who likes cooking and now has a, a way to invite people to their house and see if, they, if their cooking is appreciated. Um, then a very important aspect that's often mentioned is social, social cohesion. Uh, and this is mostly the case with the, the sharing platforms, because there you meet new, you new, meet new people probably in your neighborhood. Um, for example, if you rent a car through Snapcar, you might get to know your neighbor from three streets down the road. Um, and environmental benefits are actually uh, overestimated often, and it's actually only for Snapcar that we know for sure that it benefits the environment. And this is because, uh, because of the rebound effect. So the rebound effect means that if you save some money, for example, on, uh, no, it doesn't matter on what, but uh, well, you save some money, you have some more money to spend. So what do you do? You might book an extra holiday to Spain and go by plane, for example. And this actually brings an additional environmental burden. Um, this is all mostly related to, for example, for example, people that insulate their house, save some money on energy costs, and then take an extra trip by airplane, and then um, we're actually worse off in terms of CO2. But for Snapcar, that's not true. People actually have less, they own less cars compared to before they started sharing, using shared cars, and they also drive less. So this is a very positive uh, effect for the environment. Then, then we have a longer list of negative effects. They're also a little bit different in nature. They're more qualitative. You might, you might notice that. Um, first of all, we have some economic issues. For example, an uneven playing field. I just mentioned that in the beginning already, there might be unfair competition. Um, so I gave you the example of restaurants, but the same goes for hotels, for uh, rental car companies, but also for taxi taxi companies, um, and also the difference between uh, employees that have like a standard uh, employment contract in the cleaning sector or the ones that work through uh, helping. Then especially um, the platforms where people make quite some money, we might lose, uh, lose some tax revenue. Um, and as they grow, this becomes a a question that's more important. Then another interesting question is uh, the one of consumer protection. So if we buy a product from a company or we stay in a hotel, then we have all kinds of rights and protections. So for example, there will be a, a fire alarm, there will be some regulations on what to do when you have a complaint. Uh, if you get sick in a restaurant, there are rules for that. But what happens when you stay at an Airbnb or you go to a home restaurant. Um, so, yeah, that's not entirely clear, and that this is something that still has to kind of settle down to see what, um, what is, some things are actually possible already within the existing insurance, uh, for example. But it's something that we just start to think about. Another issue is discrimination, um, and we have this mostly from the literature from the United States, where we uh, learned that well, black people, for example, on Airbnb, they have to, they are more often, um, or they can just not rent the property they would like to go to. And if they offer their own house, they will make less money with it. So actually, this, the color of your skin has an economic value in a way, or it has consequences. And um, 
probably this is a bigger problem than in the regular housing or, or hotel sector, for example, because there's not allowed to make a distinction. Then we go more kind of to the environment. So then we have the public order. So especially um, with Airbnb and Airbnb, there are some local effects of, uh, of these platforms. So for example, Airbnb, if I would open a home restaurant in my house and invite people like big groups and, and very often, then there will be more cars in my neighborhood. They want to park their car and maybe people uh, cause noise when they leave my apartment. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's a, a problem, or it could be a problem. Actually, Airbnb limits uh, the, the number of days that you can open your home restaurant to one day a week, so it's already limited, but still. And Airbnb, I think we all know the stories about Amsterdam, where there's just an enormous increase of tourists and uh, that do not always uh, behave in a very responsible way. And if your neighbors rent out their house or apartment all the time, it will change you know, your uh, livelihood uh, a lot. Then the last three uh, aspects have to do with the nature of digital platforms. So they're, they're also related. And the first one is platform dependence. Um, so this goes for um, for the people that drive the taxi or that clean the house, that they, they're actually not allowed to go work somewhere else. Um, and at the same time, and that's actually true for the other plat platforms as well, the bigger a platform is, the bigger the chance that you will find the thing you're looking for there. So platforms kind of grow automatically. If you're, if you're the biggest, you will be bigger. Uh, and it means that it's very difficult for a new platform to get started. Uh, but it also means that as users of these platforms, we're kind of all drawn to the same platform, basically. And we don't have a lot of choice. And we don't know what these platforms will do when they are so large that they can decide about the rules. So for example, the amount of the percentage of, of the income that they will take, or, uh, you know, imagine that I'm just, it's just an imagination, but imagine that Airbnb says, well, if you, uh, if you want to search on this uh, website in our platform, you have to pay, or, or we just raise, uh, I don't know the, what the, the word is exactly, but, you know, the, the amount of money you pay for their service. So, so that's an issue. Um, yeah, it's basically monopolization, the second one. Ah, that, that's the distinction, sorry about that. Um, so the first one, platform dependence has to do with the people who work there, and the second one is more about um, the fear of creating monopoly, which will lead to lower or more expensive services for users. And another uh, newer um, concern is about privacy and autonomy. So what I think you know uh, is that these platforms gather a lot of data about its users. So both the people that offer something on the platform and the people that search for those goods or services. And um, with this, this, this information, they can actually provide you with the information they think you find interesting. So uh, you might get, sorry, you might get another uh, offer or list of offers than I get. Um, and this, in the end, influences my autonomy to decide what I want. So everybody gets into their own trail. Um, and the question is whether, whether that's the way we want it. So this was a list of, of negative effects that, uh, that we found in this research. So what can we do about all these um, effects? So uh, we see a lot of positive or potentially positive effects that we would like to stimulate. Uh, but we also see um, some effects that we would rather minimize. Um, and there are basically four policy options. And the first one is to enforce the existing rules very strictly. And this might mean a ban on the platform. And this is what happened uh, to Uberpop in the, in the Netherlands, because they were obviously not uh, following the rules of the taxi law. Um, the other thing that's possible is 
what we call ad hoc regulation. So it means that you look at this particular platform or case and uh, you make regulations to improve the situation in that, in that case. So this is what happened with Airbnb in Amsterdam and it's happening in other places uh, now as well. So Amsterdam made a deal with Airbnb that people can only rent out their house for 60 days a year and four people at a time. Um, and this sounds easy, but it wasn't because Airbnb is a very big international player. Um, so it's really kind of a, a negotiation process to, uh, for, the, for the local government to get what it wanted. And uh, after this rule was introduced, the situation still wasn't solved because the local government doesn't know how many days people in Amsterdam rent out their apartments. So uh, Airbnb w would have to tell either the local government or its users. And they said, well, um, we don't want to uh, infringe upon the privacy of our users. So then there was this fight about the data. And um, I think it took two years for Airbnb to say, OK, then we will take the advertisement of this particular house off the website until January 1st of next year. Um, yes. So that's some detail on that, on that case study. Um, another thing, so in a more abstract sense, this regulation is about maximizing the use of a specific platform in order to, uh, to limit the negative consequences. Then the other thing that's possible, but which we didn't see in, uh, in our research, is deregulation. That means that um, you actually skip some rules, either... Um, so, for example, you could say that also hot for hotels it's not necessary to have a fire alarm. That's just an example. So that, then you deregulate and it means that you create one market. Uh, so there is a level playing field, there's fair competition, but there will be a lower level of protection for everybody. And uh, the difference with the maximization approach that I just described is in that case, you will have two markets. You will have the professional, the traditional sector with all its rules and protections. And on the other hand, you have these 60 days you can rent out your apartment. But if I as a user stay in your apartment, then I should know that I don't, don't enjoy the same level of protection. Um, so these are kind of two different uh, approaches. And the last one is to not do anything. And in Dutch, we call this uh, gedogen. Um, so it means there are rules, but we don't enforce them. And this is the case so far with Helpling and Airbnb and, uh, and Snapcar. And for Snapcar, there's even a green deal car sharing. So that's, as I already said, it has a lot of positive consequences. So that's why um, the government and also local governments and other organizations are really willing to stimulate it. So in, in our report, Snapcar is a little bit of, of the odd one out in a positive sense. So no intervention is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, yeah, as I said, we try to increase the level of the public debate about issues about science or related to science and technology. Um, so with this report, we also sent a, a report to Parliament with, with the most important findings. Um, and they actually uh, asked the minister for a response to our report. Um, the minister didn't reply yet because he needs to coordinate this with three or, three or four other ministries because it's such a big issue covering multiple ministries. Um, however, we already had the debate in Parliament out about the report because apparently they didn't want to wait to de debate this report, so that was an interesting situation. So we actually had 20 recommendations, uh, which is a lot, so these are the most important ones or the ones that we wanted to, to highlight. So what we say is in the early stages of a platform, when it's new, when it's small, tolerate it. Just see what happens and learn. See what, what the positive effects are and what the downsides are. And also, it also means that we allow new platforms next to the very well-known and bigger platforms, because that's important for the, for the competition. Secondly, uh, clarify the legal status of sharing and gig platforms. Um, what we saw in, basic, in almost all of these case studies is that it's unclear what the legal status of these platforms is. So for example, Uberpop, uh, well, 
when we think of Uberpop, we think of taking a taxi. But Uberpop said, no, we're not a taxi company. We are a technology company. So we don't have to abide by the taxi law. And by the way, it's very unclear. Um, and then in the end, the court said, no, you, you are a taxi company and a technology company. So you do have to follow these rules. So basically, as long as it's unclear what type of company or yeah, a platform is, it's unclear what their responsibilities are. Um, and that's not a situation we want to stay in for very long. So uh, it would be very helpful to clarify the legal status. Um, then in the longer run, and actually we get back to this point in the case study about helping the legal status. Um, in the long run, we would say don't ban the platform and don't just tolerate it, but maxim maximize the use of it or deregulate. So that those are the two options I just discussed. So either you say, okay, there are two different things, but then the use of platform should be a small thing, or we kind of make the same rules for everybody and we deregulate, but then we kind of lower the standard for everybody. Um, and these are very important choices because they have very big consequences. Uh, for example, if we say, um, if we want to deregulate in relation to gig platforms, it means that actually the labor rights and labor protections will go down for everybody and we will all end up in a situation where we have a kind of more uncertain working situation. So these are important choices. Then um, the last two points again relate to the nature of platforms and the digital world basically. Um, for most of the recommendations we make it's very important to have for, for the government to have data about the users of the platform or the use of the platform. Because how can you enforce a rule of maximum 60 days a year if you don't know how many times people rent out their apartment? So you basically need the data. But then most of the platforms say, yeah, but you know we have privacy rules. We're not going to give you this data. Um, so what we suggest is looking at the option of a trusted third party that is a, another actor in the middle that actually has access to this data about the users and the use of platforms um, and enables these policies to, to be implemented, but that also protects the privacy of the users. Um, and it can also check if the platform actually um, provides the right data. And then from the consumer point of view, we think it's very important um, if we can carry our reputation data. So, with reputation data, we mean the profile you have. So for example, if I rent out my apartment on Airbnb and people were happy about me, and this happened a lot of times, I have kind of a strong profile. And this will help me both rent out my, my apartment more easily and also rent other people's houses or apartments more easily. Um, but what if Airbnb changes their, their conditions and I would like to go to another platform and I have to start from scratch building my reputation. You know, so that makes it very difficult to actually switch platforms. Um, so we say look at a way to make this data portable or to take it with you. It's, it's not as easy as it sounds because who, who should be this actor and yeah, we probably don't want the government to have our profile, right? So and how do you do this? But well, it's the aim is to make sure that we can actually pick and choose between platforms and not get stuck with one kind of monopoly uh, platform.